Hello and welcome to a Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 27th of September to the 3rd of October, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. And this week I join you from Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, where my brother has just gotten married. Congratulations to him and Katie. Before getting into this week's news updates, a special shout out to our good friends at GoTikonauts and SpaceWatch.Global, two excellent sources of space industry news. This week, we're going to unpack the return to flight of the Kuaizhou 1A, but before we do that, we have a lot of updates on China's future space projects and some commercial space announcements from this week's Zhuhai Air Show in Zhuhai, Guangdong. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. <laughs> So, John, you went to the Zhuhai Air Show in 2018, and I understand it sounds like it's changed a lot since then. What's going on there in 2021? So, really, a lot, a lot of things to cover and to unpack over the past week on the Zhuhai Air Show. So, this was the 13th edition of the Zhuhai Air Show. As you mentioned, Blaine, it took place in the South China metropolis of uh, Zhuhai. This was between the 28th of September to the 3rd of October, and this is where we saw a very significant number of uh, space updates as well as insights into China's um, space program. And this is rather unexpected because this air show has been held since uh, 1996. And generally, it is a big venue, but mostly for commercial and military aviation. But for space, not so much. Um, and I remember going there to the exhibition in 2018 and just going through, strolling through the exhibition. Like I, I remember only seeing one commercial uh, Chinese space company, which was iSpace at the time, although there were quite a few already state-owned enterprises. But this year, it seems like the entire space elite was there with dozens and dozens of commercial space companies having stands at the show. And probably related to this growth, um, traditionally there were like, so in 2018, there were eight exhibition halls and this year it grew to 11 exhibition halls so in 2021. So lots of stuff going on. And if we cover some of the main announcements, maybe first one from my side here is China's first mission extension vehicle or MEV that was revealed to the public for the very first time. MEVs are really a new type of vehicle of spacecraft to hit the market with the only operational service currently coming from from Northrop Grumman in the US and their MEV spacecraft. And these spacecraft, which look like ordinary satellites, have the objective of performing rendezvous with an aging satellite, generally a satellite that's in geostationary orbit, and extending their lifespan. And this can be done, for example, by attaching themselves to the satellite and performing attitude and orbital control for the satellite. Uh, and this is what Northrop Grumman's MEV does. Or uh, the spacecraft can actually directly refuel the aging satellite instead. And this is the technical solution that China's MEV has been going for. So the Chinese MEV is developed by the Institute 805 of SAS, the Shanghai Academy of Space Technology. And it will carry 1.3 tons of fuel, which represents roughly 52% of the total mass of the um, spacecraft. And according to Chinese reports, refueling a geostationary satellite uh, instead of launching a brand new satellite can save up to 35% uh, of the cost. Although probably this 35%, this percentage is strongly linked to the, um, the satellite that you're trying to breathe a new life into. So that's the first update. The second very big update of the show is that China also displayed publicly for the first time its first ever space-based solar imaging spacecraft called CHASE, which is short for China H-Alpha Solar Explorer. And the spacecraft is rather small to medium-sized. It's at 550 kilograms and is planned to be launched uh, by the end of this year. It will remain in Earth's orbit at an altitude of roughly 520 kilometers uh, in sun-synchronous orbit. And its main instrument will be an H-Alpha imaging spectrograph. Now, as an astrophotography fan, let me just cover a little bit what that is. Um, the sun today can be imaged by any you know, ordinary camera chip and lens, as long as you put a filter to limit the amount of light that's hitting your sensor. And this is called white light imaging because you're imaging in the visible spectrum of light, right? Um, but there's also specific sets of camera filters that can enable you to only capture very specific wavelengths. And one such a wavelength is a deep red spectral line that's called H-alpha that's at a wavelength 
wavelength of 656.28 nanometers. And these specific wavelengths have the advantage of revealing very specific solar phenomena, such as solar prominences. And this is exactly the wavelength that Chase, the Chinese spacecraft, is going to use to image the sun. The next big update is more from the launch side of things. Uh, we saw a new engine uh, being displayed in the Cask Exhibition Hall, the YF-102 engine. And apparently this is an 85-ton thrust class Carolox engine in the final stages of testing, with six fully assembled engines having already performed test fires, including some that have lasted up to 200 seconds. This engine apparently could be operational by 2022, and the company Cask is even considering making a reusable version of this engine called the YF-102R um, you know, to be ready uh, by 2026. I think one important point worth noting when, when, I mean, when seeing this piece of news is that we, we really don't know yet which rockets are going to use this engine. Because when you look at the current generation of Long March rockets, and notably the new generation rockets, they're all already equipped with mostly uh, the YF-100 family of rocket engines. And so there's no real space for a new engine. And the fact that Cask regularly highlighted uh, the reusability as well as the cost efficiency of the design of this new YF-102 and you know, really leveraging 3D printing, things like that, this does suggest that the rocket will be put um, to a commercial use. And during the air show, there are also five engine and nine engine layouts that were shown in a video featuring this engine, which is suggestive of a, you know, maybe a Falcon 9 or a Falcon 5 type reusable rocket. Now, all of this, of course, at this uh, stage remains kind of speculative, but we'll have to wait and see which rockets will actually use this engine. I guess it's not excluded that, um, you know, a commercial rocket company uses uh, this engine. The next update comes from also the launch side of things. Uh, it's about the Long March 8, which for those who don't know, is the most recent Long March rocket to enter service with the maiden launch having taken place basically one year ago in December 2020. And so we saw an interview of Xiao Yun, who's the chief designer of the Long March 8 rocket. And Xiao Yun notably claimed that CALT, so the Chinese Academy of Launch Technology, was considering setting up a dedicated launch pad for the Long March 8 at the Wenchang Launch Center, even though the rocket has already launched with the existing infrastructure that was present in uh, Wenchang. Xiao Yun also further explained that this was um, envisaged in the perspective of China's massive future launch demand uh, for Constellation projects. And he even went as far as to say that two dedicated Long March 8 launch pads could be set up at Wenchang, and this would enable a launch of a Long March 8 once every seven days. And that's about 50 launches of Long March 8s a year, which is absolutely crazy when you consider that today, I mean, the total number of launches in China this year, or just any past year, has never gone beyond a 40, so let alone 50. So I'm not really sure what to think of this announcement. It does raise the question of the, for example, the cost efficiency of the Long March 8 for Constellation deployment, uh, considering that the Long March 8 will be in com competition with the uh, medium lift launch vehicles coming from commercial companies. And speaking of commercial companies, I'm not even sure that there'll be much of a market, domestic market left for, you know, the iSpaces, the land spaces, the galactic energies, and just any other commercial launch company that's developing a medium lift launch vehicle if Cal, the Chinese Academy of Launch Technology, goes forward with this very ambitious plan for the Long March 8. I think overall, this is a good example, I think, of uh, the Chinese government, you know, supporting and uh, wanting to develop a thriving new space launch sector, but at the same time, inexplicably also creating a massive competition for these new space guys, but from the uh, state-owned enterprises. So yeah, speaking of CALT and commercial satellite deployment, Blaine, I think that CASC overall just seemed to be an, on an absolute roll at Zhuhai, and I think there are also many, many uh, commercial launch contracts that were announced. Um, do, do you want to maybe cover that? Definitely. So just a couple of quick points to unpack on, on what you've just mentioned, and then I'll, I'll get into the different um, different launch contracts that we saw. Um, so with regard to the Long March 8, definitely that's, um, I suppose, probably it, it lines up well with what we discussed last week about the development of the Wanchang space economy more generally, this idea of having uh, a dedicated launch site for the Long March 8 over at Wanchang. Um, and I guess the other point I would mention is that certainly it creates a lot of competition for the systems level commercial launch companies. But at the same time, I could also imagine um, there would be a lot of complexities in ramping up the supply chain to build 50 Long March 8s per year. And so you might see a situation where companies like, I don't know, Jojo Yundian or, or even, you know, some of the systems level companies like Landspace uh, would win some business for sort of subsystems level components that would be needed to build 
50 Long March 8s, which, as you mentioned before, uh, Cask currently does not necessarily have the capacity to do, given how much they're launching this year. Um, but definitely, either way, I think, uh, this year at the Juhai Air Show, it was really the year of uh, commercial space and of traditional space companies doing more commercial things. So to get into a couple of announcements that I would like to cover from uh, from the Juhai Air Show. So basically, the first main takeaway from my side in terms of commercial developments is that it seems everyone this year was signing contracts with CGWIC, or the China Great Wall Industry Corporation, a trading company and commercial subsidiary of Cask. And so, um, yeah, so this year we had uh, the first announcement uh, for the CGWIC was the formal announcement of the Tianxian constellation, uh, which was announced in collaboration with Space T and the 38th Institute of the China Electronics and Technology Corporation, or CETC. The deal with CGWIC is to launch multiple satellites in the 96 satellite Tianxian constellation. So Tianxian is envisaged as having 96 SAR Earth observation satellites. Uh, and it involves multiple players that were previously involved in another SAR uh, satellite, the HISA-1 satellite launched in December of 2020. Uh, and so again, this is a collaboration between Spacity and the 38th Institute of the CETC. And the deal calls for the first satellite to be launched in February of 2022, and for a second subsequent batch of satellites to be launched in Q3 of 2022. So definitely interesting collaboration here with CETC being a very large state-owned enterprise and uh, actually even larger now having merged, I believe, earlier this year with Potavio or Putian, which is another very large state-owned enterprise. And this makes CETC larger than both Cask and Kasich. Um, as a small kind of review, CETC, their main area of expertise is to make electronic components, but they also do quite a lot in different space industry areas, including components for satellite manufacturing and related uh, as we know, Spacity, one of the partners here, is also one of the leading commercial satellite manufacturers in China. And so given the resources of these two companies and given the pretty aggressive timeline already laid out, uh, which includes, as I mentioned earlier, the first batch of satellites being launched within the next, say, six months, um, we're probably going to see quite a few of these SAR satellites launched in the next couple of years. And I think this is just the latest example of SAR being a very big topic in China. We covered this on a couple of previous episodes, including a deep dive into the SAR wars, as we, we called them uh, just a couple of months ago. And so moving on to the next couple of announcements between CGWIC and commercial companies, uh, we saw Galaxy Space, Mino Space, Gi Space, and Ada Space, all four commercial satellite manufacturers, and in some cases, satellite operators, uh, sign contracts with CGWIC for launch services. And so all of the deals are expected to be completed in, in 2022 in terms of the actual launch service, uh, with Galaxy Spaces coming in Q1, Ada Spaces being announced as early 2022, and then the other two, Mino Space and Gi Space, being announced for unspecified times during the year. I would also note that in the case of Galaxy Space, the deal is for six satellites, and in the case of Mino Space, it is for seven satellites. And so just a couple of things to unpack. I think the first important point to note is that these seem to be pretty big contracts, in particular with Galaxy Space and Mino Space, who are both launching probably about a thousand kilograms of payload, give or take, um, and on cask rockets, which are in some ways cost competitive, but probably not as aggressive on price as some of the commercial launch companies. And so really these contracts, in particular Galaxy Space and Mino Space, we're looking at probably 10 million US dollars or more if we assume a price of say 10,000 per kilogram, which seems fairly aggressive. Um, the third contract with Ada Space, it seems to be somewhat smaller, probably one satellite, but still um, a, a pretty clear indication of the relative maturity in terms of both financial, they need to be able to buy this launch capacity, but also to a certain extent in terms of political maturity by these commercial launch companies. So as we mentioned before, a lot of the time in China, there is not that much launch capacity, despite the fact that, you know, CASC launches 40 times per year, because there's a lot of big national missions. And so for a commercial launch company to be able to procure an entire rocket for themselves or a large part of a rocket, um, that in and of itself is, is also fairly significant, I think. I think another point of, uh, to take away here is the extent to which CGWIC appears to now be doing business with commercial space companies. And so just to review a little bit, CGWIC, as I mentioned earlier, they are a trading company and commercial subsidiary of CASC, and most of their business historically has been done with international customers. There has not been a whole lot of, you know, of business with CGWIC and commercial space companies in China. 
Uh, and this is certainly starting to change. And I think, again, it's an indication of the extent to which these commercial companies are becoming bigger, wealthier, and relatively more mature companies, which represents a better market uh, for CGWIC. So just to unpack a little bit, a couple of the deals with CGWIC. Uh, the deal with Mino Space, uh, the launch will be in 2022 on a Long March 8, and it will be seven Earth observation satellites, ranging from a 0.5 meter resolution optical satellite to a one meter SAR satellite, and a couple more satellites for the Hainan-1 constellation of EO satellites. I would say that the move really solidifies Mino Space's role as an Earth observation satellite manufacturer. Um, and really, I think it, it's... Um, it also mentions that the payloads will cumulatively weigh around one ton. So again, looking at about 100 to 150 kilograms per satellite. Uh, in the case of Galaxy Space, we're going to see six low Earth orbit communication test satellites. So basically, probably quite similar to the Yinha-1 or Galaxy-1 satellite that Galaxy Space launched back in January of 2020. And that was actually China's first low Earth orbit broadband satellite with about 10 gigabits per second of Q and V band capacity. And so these next six satellites to be launched next year are likely going to be test satellites to demonstrate Galaxy Space's capabilities to manufacture broadband satellites, most probably with the intention of trying to sell satellites to China's Guowang or um, sort of the national net uh, large low Earth orbit broadband constellation. And so, again, over the next uh, year or so, we're going to see Galaxy Space launch six more test low Earth orbit satellites. So just a couple of last updates on my side from the Zhuhai Air Show that are not related to CGWIC. I would point out that Galaxy Space was not the only company at the show making progress with communication satellites. So we did see during the Zhuhai Air Show, Kasich unveiled two new satellite prototypes for low Earth orbit broadband communications, both of which were apparently manufactured at the company's Wuhan National Aerospace Industrial Base. And so Kasich definitely seems to be moving more into low Earth orbit and, and satellite communications um, as we are starting to see these you know, very big projects coming, coming through in, in China and as we're starting to see more uh, opportunities in, in commercial space more generally. Um, other than that, we also did see APT Mobile Satcom, which is a geostationary satellite communications company, book a turnkey satellite and launch for an apparent Europe, Middle East, and Africa high throughput satellite, uh, which is noteworthily going to be based on the Dongfang Hong 3E or DFH 3E platform, uh, which is a kind of interesting move given that we have recently seen the retirement of the DFH 3. And we have been seeing the DFH 4 and 4E in service for quite a long time, and even the DFH 5 now. Uh, so the use of the DFH-3E for this Europe, Middle East, and Africa high-throughput satellite for APT Mobile Satcom probably is an indication of a relatively smaller high-throughput satellite, probably simpler design, probably lower cost, and therefore lower risk. Um, but certainly a couple of really interesting updates on, on the satellite communication side from uh, from the Zhuhai Air Show. Uh, very last update from the air show on my side, we did see another article that said that CASC had signed about 4 billion RMB worth of launch and commercial space contracts on just the 29th of September, so the first day of the show. Uh, and so a couple of takeaways there, just a crazy number of commercial satellite manufacturers uh, booking flights on, on CASC or CALT rockets and just a very large number of contracts announced overall by, uh, by CASC. Um, so, John, anything else from your side on, on the Zhuhai Air Show? Uh, yeah, and as, as, here. as we were sort of saying before the recording, um, it does sound very impressive to have all of these announcements at the show, but that's actually a general practice where companies tend to delay their announcements until a big event and to announce them all at the same time uh, for some context. I also want to discuss maybe the Zhuhai Air Show, but more from a space enthusiast perspective. This show was probably a fascinating one to stroll through as a visitor because while the uh, the show was mainly open to professionals for the first few days, the last few days, however, were open to the general public. And it's undeniable that Chinese space companies have put a massive effort to make uh, the air show a nice place to walk through for just any ordinary visitor. And so beyond the flight demonstrations, which I will not get into because our channel focuses more on the space industry, there were also absolutely fascinating spacecraft models displayed to the public. Let's just go through some of the superstars of the show. I think the absolute superstar probably was the actual Chang'e 5 return capsule that was displayed with the lunar um, samples. So a, 
a little bit, a little part of the 1,731 kilograms that were brought back by the Chinese almost a year ago. And um, you, you can see in detail the scorched surface of the capsule that traveled 400,000 kilometers to the moon and back. So that was very cool. I think the other big superstar of the show was China's first ever next generation crewed vehicle, the NGCV, which can be understood to be roughly um, China's Orion capsule. It is able to host up to seven Taikonauts, and it was launched for the first time in 2020 for the maiden launch of the Long March 5B. And so the capsule has not reflown since. That was a verification test flight. And so the capsule was displayed uh, during the Zhuhai Air Show. It's worth noting that the NGCV is designed for both LEO and also for beyond the Earth's orbit, and so it should play an instrumental role in China's upcoming crew lunar missions at the end of the decade. I also want to mention that um, at the air show, there was also the parachutes that were used at, by the NGCV that were displayed uh, next to the uh, scorched test capsule. Next, we also had a mock-up of the Tianwen-1 Mars lander and Struang rover, probably one of the most famous Chinese spacecraft of 2021. And this was put on a surface of sand, which was meant uh, very likely to imitate the Martian surface. And I think there was also at the Zhuhai Air Show a rather rare sight, and that is a replica of the Tengyun two-stage to orbit horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing space plane that's currently being developed by Kasich. And there is also a very interesting video of the spacecraft being used for passenger point-to-point -point intercontinental transportation. So it does seem that um, Kasich is still pushing forward the space plane project, um, and which is one of the main, uh, let's say, commercial space plane projects that are being developed currently at the moment. Finally, special mention to the very well-furnished display of Long March rockets, which is now more or less the Zhuhai Air Show Classic, uh, with notably the presence of the future lunar rockets, so the super heavy SLS class Long March 9, and there was also the much lighter Long March 5 DY. Also worth noting, there was the presence of the Long March 6A, which is a rocket that hasn't flown yet. And it's basically a, you know, a beefier Long March 6, but uh, with four strap-on boosters as well. So a lot of space stuff really happening at Zhuhai this week. Um, but to wrap this up, I just want to add that some things were also happening in parallel of this air show and not at all at Zhuhai. So I'm nearly thinking of the Kwaijo launch. And uh, Blaine, do you want to tell us a little bit about Kwaijo and their very significant launch over the past week? Absolutely. But before I do, just a very short reminder that despite all of the discussion we've just had on the Zhuhai Air Show, we did not get into anywhere close to all of the updates from the Zhuhai Air Show. A lot more contracts signed. Absolutely. And so to check out more information, I do encourage you to go to our newsletter at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. Getting over to the Kwaijo rocket launch from this week. So on the 27th of September, Monday, we saw the successful return to flight of the Kwaijo 1A rocket manufactured by Kasich's commercial subsidiary X-Base. And so this is a successful return to flight following the failure of the Kwaijo 1A just about one year ago in its 10th flight, its previous nine, I'm sorry, its 11th flight, its previous 10 flights prior to last year had all been successful. And the solid-fueled rocket built by X-Base is meant to be what they would call fast response and also quite flexible. It is built to use a TEL, or a transporter erector launcher, if my uh, memory serves me correctly. And this week, the successful return to flight was launching the Jilin-1 Gaofan 2D Earth Observation Satellite to be operated by the good folks over at the friend of the Dongfang Hour, CGSTL, over in Changchun. So just a couple of very quick points to unpack about this X-Base Kwaijo 1A launch. Definitely, this is a very big win for X-Base, and this launch was a classic example of massive asymmetric downside, which is to say, if the launch had failed, it would have been pretty devastating for X-Base. As I mentioned last year, they suffered a failure in the 11th attempt of the Kwaijo 1A, just a few months before that, and I believe July, they had suffered a failure in the inaugural launch of the Kwaijo 11, a much larger or a rather larger rocket. So really, we had a year more or less of complete silence from X Base, and leading up to this launch, there was a lot of uh, tension, let's say. And so again, uh, asymmetric downside, a failure would have been catastrophic, but congratulations to X Base. We can all breathe a sigh of relief because the Kwaijo 1A has successfully returned to flight. Uh, and I would also mention that 
uh, Xbase does plan to launch a second uh, Quadro 1A before the end of this year. So we may get back to a, a bit of a groove here in terms of their, their launch cadence. Um, and so I would say that a couple of takeaways would include the fact that the return to flight of the Quadro 1A may make it relatively easier for commercial satellite manufacturers to find space on launches. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the launches that are organized by CASC are oftentimes spoken for. And so the commercial satellite companies often take kind of a back seat and a second priority. And so having more Quadro 1As launching will be helpful. As I mentioned a moment ago, Xbase did say at the time of launch, they have another Quadro 1A ready to launch before the end of the year. At the time of the launch, they also mentioned that they are now at the point of being able to manufacture 20 Quadro 1A rockets per year, presumably from their Wuhan National Aerospace Industrial Base over in Wuhan. And with a capacity to low Earth orbit or sun-synchronous orbit of some several hundred kilograms, the Quadro 1A is not a huge rocket, uh, but it can still launch several small sats at a time, and that can help accelerate some of these launch plans for some of China's uh, commercial satellite manufacturers. And so just a couple of things to watch for moving forward are going to be the second launch of the Quadro 1A, which I just mentioned earlier. That's going to be quite important. And as I mentioned, if we do get to a point where Xbase is consistently launching the Quadro 1A and Quadro 11, uh, their launch capacity. Uh, their, their potential for high launch cadence is relatively high, it seems. So that could be quite significant. Um, I would also then note that the Quadro 11, as I mentioned, it will be launched uh, most probably next year with a payload to orbit of between 1 and 1.5 tons. So again, quite a bit larger than the Quadro 1A and certainly going to represent one of the more sophisticated rockets manufactured by uh, by China's you know, plethora of commercial launch companies. Uh, moving forward. So, Jean, anything from your side on the Quadro 1A return to flight or X-Base more generally? Uh, just a fun fact on the launch that happened over the past week, the satellite, so CGSTL satellite was named after one of Tencent's popular video games called Peace Elites or He Ping Jingying. And this is an, an apparent uh, collaboration that we mentioned uh, previously. I think it was in May 2021. Um, so a collaboration between Tencent, so the provider of the mm. game, the CGSTL, which provides the payload, and XSpace, which provides the launch services. So it's uh, it's nice to see some you know some Chinese space culture come into uh, the launch as well. So uh, yeah, I think uh, with that, I think we're about in good for this week. Indeed, Ten Tencent, the hometown team. That's always good to see them coming into space. And a good reminder on the topic of Chinese space culture to be on the lookout for our next long form episode on Chinese space culture coming out later on this month. That being said, I don't think anything else from my side. So this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 27th to September to the 3rd of October, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. And if you like what you have heard, I would encourage you to go and check out newsletter.dongfanghour.com for our newsletter that is chock full of additional insights. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to support us, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment and interact with us in the comment section below. And also do check out our new website, which has been entirely updated with a new design and a better user experience. We'll be posting articles there for our followers that have a preference for the written word. And apart from that, I'm Jean Deville from the Dongfang Hour. Join as always by Blaine Curcio, my co-host. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.